Welcome to the launch of the 2020 Global Agricultural Productivity Report, Productivity in a Time of Pandemics. This year, we will explore the impacts of pandemic scale outbreaks of pests and diseases on the productivity and resilience of our agricultural systems. Although we are disappointed to not be together in Des Moines for our launch this year, we are taking advantage of this opportunity to feature people on the front lines of agricultural pandemics, especially farmers, and to see the challenges they face firsthand. The GAP report would not be possible without the effort, contributions, and thought leadership of our supporting and consultative partners. Our supporting partners provide the funding for the GAP report and the other activities that are part of the Global Agricultural Productivity Initiative at Virginia Tech. Our supporting partners are Bayer Crop Science, Corteva AgriScience, John Deere, The Mosaic Company, Smithfield Foods, and Virginia Tech's College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. Our consultative partners enrich our work through their expertise in productive and sustainable food and agriculture systems, nutrition, and natural resource conservation. I also wish to thank Dr. Alan Grant, Dean of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, and other faculty members and university leaders at Virginia Tech who helped to guide the work of the GAP Report. We know that you share our vision for a food and nutrition secure world. We invite you to learn more about our partnerships around the globe, our partnerships that focus on food and nutrition security, youth engagement in agriculture, animal and human health, nutrition, and more. Whatever you do, wherever you work in the world, Virginia Tech has something to offer. We are seeking new partners for the GAP Report and our other initiatives in this all-important endeavor for humanity's future. So now, please enjoy the launch of the 2020 GAP Report, and thank you for joining us. Mandinangu ni here na njiko awero, naishi pia vi, Joro Ward, Nakuru County, Kenya. Niko na shaba tu ikas, na ninari mangombe, na ninari makuku, ninari machakura ya ngombe, na ninari ma ninari ma dairy goat na kuku. So sasa ni na kamu amaziwa, ni na ni na pere kasoko. Nari po akash in hard, nari po akash in hard. Yeah, na 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 ya kutuna tukiwa ukiwa tukiwa tunataka kutengeneza silage hiyo mashini ndio inatusaidia nimeweka mess jam na nikaweka wheat bran na nikaweka sunflower nikaweka cotton eh sasa na hii minerals 1% na ndio DCP kuna moja si Ilisha sasa sijaweka, naitadi ilipremi. Aya, sasa hapa nilikuwa na kangombe karoko. Kare ngombe roko, mwenye haa kuwa natuwa maziwa, alikuwa maziwa, anatuwa 3 liters. So, nikataka kuimprove, nikauza uyo, nikanunua mwingine. Sasa mwenye niko nae, mwenye nilikamua subuhi, wakati sasa ameza huo na kamua 15 liters pande na hizi ni charges za maneno ya ECF ECF ni, ni ugonjwa wa ngai kwenye inakuwa costi sana hiyo kutibu ndio namwambia ngombe mkubwa ni 4000 kutibu hizo kuna sasa magonjwa zenzi zinataka vaccine na kuna za hata za daily goods za pneumonia zinatakiwa vaccine 
sasa wakati hatuja vaccine wanagonjeka wakigonjeka sasa wakikufa sasa tunaona mapapo mapato yanarudi chini kwa sababu wakati huo utapata pesa na maji challenge na hapa tena kuna kuwa na jua kali sana sasa maji zinakuwa ni maji inakuwa ni shida sasa unaona hiyo inaweza kunifanya niremewe kufanya nini kulima na kufikisha kufikia vision yangu mahali mimi nataka kufika na ya gasi hata mvua inaweza nyesha kubwa ipige chakula yenye ya, ya, ya mawe ipige chakula yenye nimepanda sasa unaona kama ni soko wakati huo utakuwa na soko utakuwa na kiti ya kupeleka kwa soko so vision yangu na naomba Mungu aisaidie kama haya ma challenge nimesema hapa nisikutane nayo ndio niweze kuwa na opportunities nyingi niweze kufikia challenge zangu niweze kufikia vision yangu Thirty years from now, we will need to produce food, feed, fiber, and bioenergy for nearly 10 billion people, increasing the productivity of our agricultural systems, especially for the smaller farmers who grow most of the world's food, is absolutely vital. We have been reminded in recent days of the importance of resilience to our food systems, particularly in the face of pandemics. Pandemic-scale disease and pest outbreaks kill and sicken people, livestock and crops with alarming frequency. They disrupt economies, destroy livelihoods, and damage our natural resource base. The COVID-19 shutdowns may drive an additional 100 million people into extreme poverty and double the number of people at risk of acute hunger. Fall armyworm is a global scourge that destroys up to 18 million tons of maize crops annually in Africa alone. Over the last two years, China has lost 40% of its swine population to an outbreak of African swine fever that afflicts three continents. For our 11th annual Global Agricultural Productivity Report, we look at these and other pandemic scale outbreaks that threaten the productivity and resilience of our agriculture systems. Agricultural productivity growth is key to meeting the demands of a growing world and resilience ensures that our agriculture systems can withstand crises and emerge relatively intact. Today, we will hear from producers and experts around the world about their experiences with these threats, as well as technologies and practices that help producers withstand and recover quickly from pandemics. Shortly, we will reveal the 2020 Global Agricultural Productivity Index, which tracks global progress toward our productivity goals. But before we do, it is helpful to understand what productivity in agriculture is and how it relates to resilience. Population and income growth are two of the major drivers of increased demand for agricultural products. And while the global population and incomes are not rising as fast as they were 20 years ago, we still need to sustainably produce enough food, feed, fiber, and bioenergy for 10 billion people in 2050. Agricultural producers can use several strategies to increase their output to meet this demand. They can bring new arable land into production for crops or livestock. They can extend irrigation into new areas and they can increase the amount of agricultural inputs they apply on existing cultivated land or use more livestock to increase their output of meat, eggs, or milk. These methods need to be used strategically to reduce negative outcomes such as a loss of biodiversity, soil degradation and erosion, and higher greenhouse gas emissions. The GAP report argues that focusing on total factor productivity growth, or TFP, will enable us to sustainably meet the needs of producers and consumers today and in the future. It's important to note that productivity in agriculture is different from yield, although the terms are often used interchangeably. Yield measures the amount of output per unit of input, for example, the amount of wheat harvested per acre or the amount of milk produced per cow. Total factor productivity tracks the changes in how efficiently agricultural inputs are transformed into outputs. 
For example, TFP increases when producers use improved technologies to grow more crops with the same amount of land, labor, and fertilizer. The substantial increase in U.S. pork productivity over the last several decades demonstrates how total factor productivity works and the economic and environmental benefits of TFP growth. Pork production in the United States has grown substantially in the past few decades. At the same time, pork environmental impacts have actually shrunk. As compared to 1960, a pound of pork requires less energy, less water, 75% less land, and the carbon footprint is nearly 8% smaller. In fact, today, the carbon footprint of U.S. pork production is just one-third of 1% of all U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. And pork producers are using far less feed per pound. Why is that? Selecting and breeding pigs with the best genes so that they are healthier, and they use less feed, and they produce more meat. Better animal care, healthier pigs, or more productive pigs. Advanced feed and nutrition, Indoor housing, which protects the animals from predators, weather, parasites, and disease. Manure management systems, which remove manure from the barns and produces renewable natural gas on farms. At the same time, crop productivity has increased substantially as well. Advances in seed varieties and precision agriculture allows farmers to produce more alfalfa, more corn, and more soybeans using less land, less water, less pesticide, less fertilizer. Thanks to TFP growth, consumers around the world enjoy high quality, safe U.S. pork products with less environmental impacts than ever before. To increase productivity, producers of all scales need access to innovative technologies, accurate agronomic knowledge, and timely market information. They also need affordable finance options so they can improve their operations. A recent review of studies on resilient agriculture found that these tools also promote resilience, especially at the farm level. Chad Lehman, a hog farmer in Illinois, describes how he adapted his animal care practices through changes in feed and housing to accommodate more animals during the COVID-19 supply chain disruptions. It's almost easier for me to talk about the ways we weren't impacted because I think our business was was different than a lot of businesses in that we still had the same workload the day after all the shutdowns as we had the day before. When you have 45,000 pigs on feed, somebody needs to be caring for them every day. Pigs don't recognize weekends, they don't recognize holidays, they certainly don't recognize pandemics. It was business as usual. By the middle of April, we immediately realized that we have got to get pigs on different diets. And we've got to somehow figure out how to keep them from gaining weight because we didn't know how long we're going to have to hold them. Then we also had to start thinking about the fact that how can we get very creative with our space? So we have so many barns and so many pigs by being able to utilize different ingredients and accessing them and being able to incorporate them into the system and into the rations helped us, I would say, gave us a competitive edge over our peers in that we were able to change so quickly when we made the decision to change diets. And I really feel like we would have been struggling with what to do with 350 pound pigs if we had not been able to incorporate different rations into our feed mill almost immediately when in our business we face crises all the time we have droughts and floods we have animal disease and then you throw in commodity price fluctuations this crisis in a way is not altogether unfamiliar to us we're used to these kind of hurdles We adapt and we change, we figure out what works, and we move on. Most of our business is out of our control. We don't control the weather. We don't control the prices. We just try to put animals in the best possible place to succeed every day. That's our job. Improved technologies and practices that enhance productivity 
are also important tools for adapting to climate change. The Chesapeake Bay watershed spans 64,000 square miles and six states from New York to Virginia. It is a sensitive ecosystem that is already feeling the impact of climate change, including heavier rain and increased soil erosion. P.J. Haney, a fifth generation farmer in Virginia, describes how conservation tillage practices protect the health and resilience of the soils on his farm. We are primarily a double crop operation in which two thirds of our acres will go into winter wheat, winter barley or winter rape seed, uh, followed by uh, soybean. We are in an area where we're very sensitive to our watershed. We all love eating blue crabs on our tailgate, so we want to take care of the Chesapeake Bay watershed so we can continue that. Um, and you know, practice to include uh, no-till, buffer strips, uh, variable rate fertility, uh, vertical tillage. And we don't we don't plow as my grandfather used to many years ago. We try to do a lot of no-till planting when we can. Climate and weather doesn't prohibit us from doing uh, you know, it. No-till the ground is cool in the spring, so we have to do some vertical tillage to kind of warm that soil up. We want to leave about 20% residue on top of the soil uh, with, with what we do in our conservation methods. And vertical tillage seems to be the way to get us to do that. We try to look at different ways of applying our nitrogen. Uh, we are doing injection to help make sure that fertility fertilizer kind of goes right in the ground. Not only do individual farmers need to be more resilient in their operations, our food supply chains must be flexible enough to adapt when a crisis comes. I think about our critical food supply chain. We go to the grocery store and we just know that the shelves are going to be packed with meats and vegetables and fruits and even toilet paper. Um, But suddenly uh, COVID-19 made us realize well, you know, we can't go to the local restaurant. Um, our, our children are not going to get their, their food through school. So now we have to quickly come together to make some decisions about how we're going to keep food, fiber, and feed flowing all of a sudden during a pandemic. How are we going to make sure that um, our aquaculture industry can survive without having restaurants available? What are our dairies going to do when they can't ship the milk to the school? How are we going to get these food to to communities that need them most, the underserved communities? For the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, our immediate thought was, let's use our social media and our communication network to say, hey, here's where you can buy local seafood. Here's what your farmer's market is now doing. Here's what your dairy industry is now doing. Um, Don't forget about Uh, where you can go to your local pick your own and pick your own fresh strawberries. And we began to promote them via social media so that people were aware. Productivity growth on the farm and throughout our value chains supports resilience in our food systems. But our 2020 Global Agricultural Productivity Index, or GAP Index, shows we still have some work to do. Welcome to the John Deere Technology Innovation Center in Champaign, Illinois, where we develop productivity enhancing innovations in artificial intelligence, advanced sensing and connectivity to help farmers sustainably feed our growing world. To sustainably produce food, feed, fiber and bioenergy production for nearly 10 billion people in 2050, we need to double our output through productivity growth. The GAP index indicates that total factor productivity must increase at an average annual rate of 1.73% to reach this goal. The most recent data show that once again, we are below that target. TFP is growing globally at an average of 1.63%. Even more troubling is the steep decline in TFP growth in low income countries. Currently, TFP is growing at just 0.58% per year. This is far below the Sustainable Development Goal target to double the productivity of smallholder farmers, most of whom live in low-income countries. In many lower-income countries, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, 
Low agricultural productivity coincides with a rapidly growing population rate and high rates of food insecurity, malnutrition, and poverty. Producers in these countries will likely continue to use land expansion as their primary source of agricultural output growth. This will put additional strain on the natural resource base and exacerbate the impact of climate change. As a result, farmers in these countries will continue to be vulnerable to pandemic scale pest and disease outbreaks, such as desert locusts that damage or destroy a source of food and income. In these labor intensive agricultural systems, illness and malnutrition significantly reduce the productivity of household labor perpetuating a cycle of poverty that is difficult to escape. Increasing access to affordable technologies and knowledge about improved practices is the key for these producers, and many efforts are underway to do so. Smallholder farmers are, are key to food security, and, and as we look at where we're headed in the next decade or so, we know that we're at a turning point. The adoption of new technologies open borders for food trade, open borders for technologies, and, and really the heightened importance of a sustainable smallholder farm are, are really gonna be key to guiding our food system through the challenges of not only pandemics like we face this year, but other challenges like climate change. We know that smallholder farmers don't just need a bag of seed, they don't just need a product to buy, they really need help to know how to grow that best and how to best protect their crop. They need more information, they need digital information at their fingertips. Every farm, every crop, every region has different challenges and requires custom approaches. So we've got to listen to what's needed on the ground. And with that, we can then bring a tailored solution to help them boost their productivity. Widespread adoption of agricultural science-based and information technologies has been the major driver of TFP growth in high-income countries. Since the 1970s, nearly all agricultural output growth has been generated by productivity growth. Yet the most recent trends show agricultural productivity growth slowing down. New revolutions in agricultural technology, including artificial intelligence and CRISPR, have the potential to boost productivity again in these countries. Productivity enhancing technologies and practices help producers prepare for and adapt to pandemic scale outbreaks of pests and diseases. For example, precision agriculture technologies provide producers with real-time data that can be used to track and isolate disease outbreaks in crops or livestock. Pest-resistant seed varieties stop outbreaks before they start. And tillage and nutrient management techniques prevent soil erosion and reduce nutrient leakages during extreme rain events. The policies and investments that support productivity growth and resilience are outlined in the GAP report. They are investing in public agricultural research and development and extension systems, embracing science-based and information technologies, Increasing access to markets of agricultural inputs and output. Expanding and improving regional and global trade. Reducing food waste and post-harvest loss. Cultivating partnerships for agricultural development and nutrition. Investments in public sector agricultural research, development, and extension systems are the foundation of agricultural productivity growth. Yet. Pandemic scale challenges are complex problems and require integrated research approaches. Dr. Cyril Clark, Executive Vice President and Provost of Virginia Tech, is a veterinarian and clinical pharmacologist. He describes the university's One Health research approach to pandemics. It's really important to understand that um, there are inextricable linkages between human health animal health and the environment. And the animal health includes the health of both, both wildlife as well as domestic animals. And uh, understanding these linkages is essential to uh, not only uh, manage pandemics such as the one that we're uh, currently addressing, COVID-19, but in fact, this pandemic is just one epidemic or one disease challenge amongst many that we have been tackling for many, many years and frankly uh, will continue to in future. About three quarters of emerging, of emerging uh, infectious diseases in 
people are actually derived from animals. So this connection, this ability for a pathogen, for a bacterium, a uh, virus and so on, to be transmitted from an animal to a person, uh, that really comes under the description of what is called a zoonotic disease. And zoonotic diseases, like coronaviruses, are immensely important. The One Health approach starts off recognizing these inextricable linkages between human health, animal health, and the health of the environment. And these, these linkages are immensely important, but they're also really complicated. So to, to tackle any problem like that, you have to adopt a, a transdisciplinary approach to the extent that you will need to convene people with this different uh, uh, types of disciplinary experience uh, and knowledge to first uh, study and understand the problem and then, and then solve it. The core mission of a land-grant institution like ours is to, is to recognize that we have a tripartite mission, that we're committed to education, we're committed to research and discovery, and we're committed to taking the, uh, the product of the education and the discovery and transferring that to the betterment of the communities we serve. Uh, we're in the process right now at Virginia Tech of uh, standing up a center uh, that will be focused on emerging zoonotic and arthropod-borne diseases. And uh, the individuals who are leading that effort are, are, are scholars that have an international reputation for the excellence of their work. And it goes beyond the capacity or the ability of a single university. And so as we advance our particular commitment to, to One Health, we will continue to engage partners in a manner that extends our commitment and engagement across every region within the Commonwealth of Virginia, the United States, and the globe. Science-based technologies and practices are essential to increasing productivity at all scales of production. Today, biological or nature-derived innovations are being used in conjunction with conventional pest management tools to prevent and control pandemic scale outbreaks. Biologicals is a very broad category. And, and because of that, there is not one accepted definition. Um, probably the, the more commonly accepted, the, the, the broadest, most general one are um, uh, solutions of natural origin. There is billions of them that have not been tested or discovered. So very rich area of, uh, of research. When you think about the, the challenge ahead for, for agriculture and whether it's a, it's a decade or, or the next 50 years, it's, we really have to drive um, uh, more um, efficiency out of production systems. So all that results in more pressure on, on the existing solutions uh, that are in place. And that's where biologicals come, come in play. Um, they work hand in hand with the conventional solution, but they, um, they supplement them. So full army worm, um, its Latin name is Podoptera frugiperida. So frugiperida means lost fruit. Um, it's, a, it's a very appropriate name because it's a devastating um, a pest that has the ability to um, uh, destroy crops in a day or two. Uh, it's extremely voracious, um, can attack dozens and dozens of, of crops, and unfortunately, a lot of um, uh, very critical crops for local sustenance, uh, particularly in, in, in Africa and, and parts of uh, Asia Pacific. The natural predators, the natural diseases for uh, uh, full armyworm are, are definitely not as present in those geographies, so the insect natural regulation uh, mechanisms are, are not in play when you get to Africa uh, and when you get to, um, to Asia Pacific. One of the behaviors that the, that the pest has is bigger, older larvae eat small, younger larvae. That means if you can contaminate some of them with a virus or a fungus, that behavior encourages the spread of the control agent in, in the population. So it, again, extremely challenging pest that will take a diversity of tools. It will take the detection, it will take the mating disruption, it will likely take starting some level of contamination in the population early on and count on that natural behavior 
to spread the disease inside the, uh, the population. And it will take conventional chemistry um, to really get it under control because just the population are so big and the amount of damage they can do is so massive that um, 90% control is not enough with full army work. Mm-hmm. And, and so you, you need to reach some, uh, some very high standards to, to get it under, under control. The genetic diversity stored in the wild relatives of staple crops like potatoes can unlock the secrets to creating varieties that are pest resistant, drought tolerant, and more nutritious. In this case of the seed, we started this work in the 70s in relation to the erosion genetic that was producing and then in los 90 aparece el problema ya de cambio climático. Y entonces, eh, estos, dos, estos dos factores eh, crean la necesidad de recolectar germoplasma porque estaba perdiéndose, o sea, había erosión genética y se estaban perdiéndose las variedades y las especies, por supuesto. La seguridad alimentaria es la base fundamental de esta filosofía de conservar la biodiversidad uh, del mundo para el futuro de la humanidad. Entonces, tenemos reserva genética uh, para cualquier uh, factor que afecte a la producción de alimentos en el mundo. Justamente, eh, el, el crear nuevas variedades es, es, justamente, es, es lento o, digamos, de acuerdo al cambio grande que está ocurriendo en el mundo, o sea, de acuerdo al cambio climático. Lo que tiene que hacerse es más bien es adaptar nuevas variedades por medio de un mejoramiento participativo con los agricultores y a gran escala. Entonces, con las papas eh, biofortificadas y en general la papa, podríamos uh, disminuir los niveles de, nutricio, de desnutrición y anemia, en especial en niños y mujeres. Estamos enfocando los esfuerzos en incrementar los valores nutricionales de la papa mediante el mejoramiento genético o lo que llamamos la biofortificación. ¿ya? Esta es una alternativa para mejorar la salud de las comunidades pobres, donde la gente no puede acceder a los alimentos fortificados comercialmente ni a suplementos vitamínicos, ¿no? Eh, y también donde la carne a veces escasea. Se piensa que la bio, biodisponibilidad de hierro en la papa eh, es mayor que en los cereales y legumbres debido a, la, a, debido a la presencia de altos niveles de vitamina C. Y esto facilita la absorción de hierro. Y tú le sumas a esto que la papa tiene bajos niveles de ácidos fíticos, eh, este último es un inhibidor de la absorción de hierro. Y lo bueno es que el CIP continúa estudiando las papas silvestres eh, para desarrollar nuevas variedades eh, climáticamente resilientes. Ahora, gracias a estas múltiples colectas, eh, se han podido, se evalúan estos materiales porque los tenemos a la mano, ¿no? los tenemos en el banco y los podemos evaluar. Eh, se conocen sus resistencias como a una enfermedad muy importante que es la Iblai, recientemente también lo que es la marchitis bacteriana. Eh, también se han tamizado estos eh, material silvestre para tolerancia a calor y sequía, que es el estrés abiótico, ¿no? y también para valor nutricional. Entonces, eh, si tú juntas, eh, utilizando las nuevas metodologías de mejoramiento, las nuevas herramientas que tenemos en el mejoramiento genético, es mucho más fácil el uso de estos eh, genes ¿no? que se encuentran en estos materiales. Productivity enhancing technologies and practices alone are insufficient to ensure resilience. Resilient agriculture systems also rely on social capital, a network of strong relationships among people who live and work in a community or society. For far too long, gender inequality and racial discrimination have isolated people who can and should be thriving participants in our agricultural systems. This must change if we are to maximize our agricultural productivity, sustainability, and resilience. In Burkina Faso, women have historically been left out of the growing poultry market. Those women that do raise poultry often don't see the economic benefits of their work, and many do not even have control over the money they earn for their families. 
Celeve, a program implemented by Tanager, an international development organization, worked to leverage and transform the poultry sector in Burkina Faso to increase the quality, efficiency, and reach of inclusive poultry services, improve women's economic and social outcomes within the supply chain, and increase consumption of safe and nutritious foods. I don't comme dans les grandes villes. Mais l'expérience a démontré que faudrait qu'il y ait la cohésion, l'accompagnement de la femme pour pouvoir subvenir aux besoins familiales. Tumla <coughs> Racial discrimination in the U.S. has prevented African-American farmers from achieving their full potential. P.J. Haney's family still cultivates land purchased by his great-great-grandfather, a former slave. But their journey to grow their operations over the generations has been fraught with obstacles and danger. My dad endured uh, high level of racial discrimination when he started farming uh, and, and after he got started. Uh, local farmers were not pleased with the growth rate that he was doing and uh, and equipment shot up, buildings burn up, uh, and just real unnecessary challenges that he shouldn't have endured. Uh, however, he, even the, the federal government, uh, my father was discriminated against by uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the lending practice. Um, and, 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 and not just our family, but thousands of African-American farm families across the country uh, were denied access to capital and credit. And it really took a generation off the farm. I mean, statistics will show you that in 1920, there were a million black farmers in the country. For 1996, there were only less than, there were less than 15,000. One of the, 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 the passions that I have is an organization called the National Black Growers Council. I'm currently the chairman of that organization. It's a nonprofit organization whose mission is to improve the efficiency, productivity, and sustainability of black row crop farmers. I've seen a big interest in farming in the African-American community. I would love to see more in row crop production, which we're doing right here. However, the barrier of entry is so high. People say if you're not born into farming or you're not married into farming, it's hard to get into farming. 
knowing the historical inequities that exist, we need to realize that this young black kid, he's not going to have the same equity balance sheet and cash flow statement as the neighbor across the road. And that's where we need some real serious conversations around the table, on the tailgate, where we can talk about how do we grow the next crop of black farmers? Because if we don't do it, who will? When people are marginalized in our agricultural systems, we miss out on a wealth of experience and innovation that has the potential to improve productivity, sustainability, and resilience. The 1890 land-grant university system was created after the Civil War to provide African Americans an agricultural education. Today, they serve the entire agricultural community. There's the misnomer in the 1890 community sometimes that people feel that the work that go on at our universities is only targeted toward the black community. Nothing could be further from the truth because we view ourselves as scientists, we view ourselves as extension specialists, we view ourselves as being on the leading edge of us outreach uh, and engagement in science. And so our target audience is not defined by race, though we have a specific interest and work with uh, underrepresented audiences and, and communities of color. Certainly that's in our wheelhouse and that's near and dear to what we do. But the productivity and the capabilities of our research span beyond just that community. This is not the time to exclude anyone from the table. We need everyone at the table. When I think about the work of black and brown and women farmers and the contributions that they've made to agriculture through their innovation, uh, their heritage, their, their em embracing uh, our environment, uh, the innovation and, and creativity is very important, but they need the opportunity to be at the table. When we give them those resources and those opportunities, we are better as an overall society. Building trust between communities within our agricultural systems overcomes barriers and facilitates the adoption of new technologies and practices for productivity and resilience. In 2008, the Mosaic Company, in partnership with the Sehgal Foundation, created Krishi Jyoti, a program to improve agricultural practices and livelihoods in new district of Haryana State in India. In the beginning, it was hard to have community participation as they were resistant to change. With regular community meetings, the foundation team could build trust with them. I work with the farm. We work with the farm from childhood. My father also worked with the farm. Before, we didn't have so much knowledge about how much food to put in, how much food to put in, how much food to put in, how much food to put in. दो साल पहले यहाँ कृषि ज्योति आई हमारे गांव में मोजक एंड सैगल फाउंडेशन उन्होंने हमें बताया हमसे पूछा भी इंटरव्यू भी किया भी आप कितनी खाद डालते हो कितनी फसल होती हो क्या क्या मात्रा डालते हो तो हमने उनको बताया भी किस किस प्रकार से कितनी खाद डालते हैं तो फिर उन्हें हमें बिठा के मीटिंग की और समझाया कि आप मिट्टी की जांच करवाइए फिर हमारी पूरे गांव की जितने भी किसान थे सबकी मौजूदा एंड सेकल फंडेशन ने खेतों की जांच करवाई मेरे भी खेत की जांच करवाई और दस साल से खेती करते हैं हम टिमाटर बाड़ी क्या जांच की पहले हमारी मिट्टी की जांच करवाई रिपोर्ट जांच के हिसाब से खाद दिया मुझे जिंक और बोरोन सल्फर और मैक्रेशम हेरस और कैल्शियम खाद मिले जिसे मैं मो इतनी उम्मीद है हमारे हिसाब से खाद डाला है जो मैं किसी प्याज निकले या मैं देख कितनी बढ़िया प्याज निकले अच्छी To address water issues Check dams were built, so water that normally washed over their fields during the monsoon season, sometimes damaging the crops too, could be forced into the aquifer. This improved the quality of drinking water and created a reserve that could be used to irrigate crops later. So, if you increase the youth, you don't have to do anything in the water. There was no big garage in the water. 
चखने की खेती आएगी तो उससे युवाओं का भी लगाव होगा हमारे यहाँ वैसे भी कोई इंडस्ट्री एरिया नहीं है काम धंधा कुछ नहीं है खेती के अलावा तो तकनीक की खेती से फसल बढ़ती है तो मुनाफा ज्यादा होता है तो युवाओं का भी लगाव बढ़ेगा The practices that were introduced to farmers through the program resulted in significantly higher yields in all three of their major crops mustard millet and wheat and this led to much greater income for the participating farmers by building trust and listening to the concerns of farmers Krishi Jyoti is helping transform these community and the program is expanding to many other villages in different states of India The lesson we can take away from today is that achieving our global goals for productivity, food security, nutrition, sustainability and economic growth requires the ingenuity and dedication of all of us, whether we are producers or consumers. We are making progress, but to ensure we don't lose ground, we must intensify our efforts to increase the resilience of our agriculture systems, especially in light of the pandemics that can destroy both lives and livelihoods. Finally, we want to express our deep appreciation to the participants in our 2020 GAP report and especially to our supporting and consultative partners who make the GAP report and the GAP initiative possible. We encourage you to read the report and access the downloadable resources at our website, globalagriculturalproductivity.org. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to continuing this journey together. Thank you.